you for joining me for another podcasting Q&A. This is July 17th, 2017, and I'm Daniel J. Lewis. So a nice date there. 7 17, 17 All the nerds will love that kind of thing. And if you're a nerd and you like kinds of numbers and how that connects to other things, then you'll enjoy my next episode of the Audacity to Podcast, which is episode 314. And it's all about everyone you should have in your circle. Get it? You get it? You get it? Okay, enough of that corny stuff. I've got some great questions from my listeners and audience to answer for you. First thing I want to talk about is should you leave SoundCloud and some thoughts on that? I know you probably are sick of hearing about SoundCloud, but I want to share some things about that and some nice news about some options you might have. Uh, Also, there's a question about the ideal desk for podcasting, a question on changing the name of a podcast to go in a different direction, a question on... uh, what kind of research or citation should be used inside of a podcast and how to get more listener engagement in addition to any questions that may pop up while I'm recording this live on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern over at theaudacitypodcast.com slash live. And I see Maurice already posted a question, which is already in my notes to answer for this. So let's start. No, I'll save SoundCloud for later because you've probably already heard stuff about SoundCloud. So I'll save that for later. And first then answer Brandon Walsh's question. He said, I've turned a really small bedroom in my house into a podcast studio. At least I am in the process of it. Though I have not podcast before now, my equipment will be professional and high quality. I would be very grateful for any advice regarding a desk. Yes, I know this may sound weird. However, I really want to have everything neat and at hand. Thanks for the question, Brandon. A desk is not really a weird thing to try and figure out. A desk is really important for your podcasting because your desk will hold all of your equipment that you're going to use for your podcast. So that's extremely important. The ideal desk will have that equipment so that it's reachable and will be able to fit all of your equipment on there, as well as be versatile enough for you to do whatever other kinds of things you might be doing at that desk. So here are some things to consider. Unfortunately, I can't say this is the exact desk for you or you must use this desk or this is the best desk for podcasting because there's really no such thing. Each podcaster's, quote, studio, unquote, and I put quotation marks around that because our, quote, studio, unquote, might be a basement, an extra bedroom, your closet, a walk-in closet, or maybe even a smaller closet with clothing around it. It could be some other kind of padded room or something. Whatever your studio space is, and call it your studio if that's where you record your podcast. It doesn't matter if it's the kitchen. It's your studio when you're recording your podcast. So don't think I'm talking about like high-end studios with sound panels and stuff like that everywhere. So wherever your studio is, you may have certain restrictions on the kind of desk you can fit into that space. That's one thing to consider. How big of a desk can you even fit? But you also have to consider what equipment are you working with? Do you have only a laptop computer? Do you have a laptop computer with an extra monitor? Do you have a desktop computer with multiple monitors? Do you have a large mixer? Do you have a small mixer? Are you recording directly into a recorder? Do you have co-hosts? Do you... um, have other equipment that you need to connect together? Do you have lighting? All of these different things need to factor into this. So the best thing really, and I'll give you some more information on some of those things to consider, but the best thing is know what equipment that you have and what kinds of needs you'll have for your podcasting, and then start looking at desks and imagine your stuff in that desk. Imagine where would you put your mixer? Where would you put your monitor? Do you like it where it is there? You may not always be able to get this from pictures, but at least try to understand it in some way and know how big the gear is that you have and whether that will fit in the different places or in different spots on your desk and thus be reachable by looking at the dimensions and such. If you can, uh, go see the desk before you decide, because then you can actually sit at it or reach around and see how far can your arm reach across this desk. But here are some things to consider. Um, With a mixer, for example, you may think you want your mixer readily, readily available, but how often are you actually going to be pressing the buttons or moving knobs on the mixer while you're recording? That may be fairly often. 
It may not. It depends on your specific podcasting workflow. Like for me, I have my mixer just to the right of me so I can very easily reach over with my hand and mute a channel if I need to, adjust volumes if I need to. I can't reach the gain knobs on my mixer without reaching over. In fact, I'll turn my camera over so you can see. My mixer is just to the right of me, so I can reach. These are the mute buttons, the volume sliders. I can adjust my headphone volume up here. I can make other certain tweaks. I can't reach up very easily and adjust the gain, which is up here, but I don't need to adjust the gain all the time. If I were to try and do this while recording, switch it back to me, and you'll see I'm kind of stretched out and having to lean over in a particular direction in order to reach that. Uh, you So keep that in mind. Can you reach what you need to reach? You may not need to be able to reach everything. Yeah, I have to reach around the back of my mixer to turn it on, but that's okay. I do that once in the morning and then once in the evening, I turn it off. Uh, if you're recording into a separate recorder, that's probably something that's much more important to be near you and in a way in front of your face. So while my mixer is over there, off to the right, my recorder is almost directly in front of me, slightly to the left of my keyboard. And that way I can very easily see the recorder. Like I'm looking at the recorder right now. I can see the screen. I can make sure that it's recording. I can very easily and discreetly reach over and press a button to place a marker on the recording in case there's something that needs to be edited in my recording or something like that, that I want to make note of or remember that spot for podcast editing later. Uh, the other thing with this is uh, think about your power, think about your audio cables, and ensure that however you route your cables and power lines, that they're not crossing over each other. You really want to keep analog audio cables away from power lines. Analog audio is probably okay next to digital uh, data cables, like a Thunderbolt or a USB cable or something like that. But as much as possible, it is nice to have your audio cables away from other things that may cause interference. Most likely, that would be your power cables. Um, and looking at a space, you need to think about cable management. Where would cables go? How would you get cables from one part to another? And you may end up having to drill some holes. That's what I did with this desk, which I've had for many, many years. I bought this from my old office where I used to work. Um, my former job, when they moved locations, they sold all of their furniture and I bought this desk and it used to have this big hutch that went to it too. I've since pulled that hutch off. I've drilled things into different places. I've moved shelves on this desk. I've changed things around. I've modded this desk a little bit for my uses. And I've drilled big holes in this desk in different places so that I could route my cables through the desk. That may be something you need to consider with the kind of desk you might be looking at. So you have to think about can a desk you want to buy have holes drilled through it? If it's a glass or a metal desk, drilling a hole is going to be a big ordeal or impossible. If it's a wooden desk or some kind of wood compo comp composite or something like that, then you can probably drill a hole through it in certain places. Um, also think about if you're working with a co-host, where would they sit? And that is an in-studio, in-person co-host. In my particular case, uh, because this is a very big desk, there's enough space on the other side of the desk that a chair could come up on that side and there's no hard wall on the back of the desk, the, the wall that keeps the desk together or the, the vertical kind of part of the desk is about in the middle. So there's enough leg room on the other side of the desk. So someone could sit at this directly across from me as if we were sitting at a table. And I love that setup because it means for one thing, since we're facing each other, we're far less likely to start talking off mic access. Like if someone was next to me, to my right or to my left, I might be tempted to turn, but if I turn like this, you can't hear me. And if I turned like that, you probably couldn't hear me or couldn't hear me very well, certainly. Now, you can adapt to that with some technique, like learning how to do the pivot around the microphone. So if you have to look in different directions, you pivot your mouth around this, imagine a balloon on the end of the microphone, and your lips stay connected to that. So you have to pivot around, so your voice is always being picked up by the microphone that can be hard to remember to do. And I've seen professional podcasters often turn their head and talk off microphone because they forgot 
or they, they come back or things like that. So if you're talking directly at each other, there's no need to turn your head. Also, being able to see each other directly like that is great for uh, nonverbal cues, hand gestures to signal, hey, I've got something to say, or I'm good, I'm finished with this, or hey, let's wrap this up, or uh, wait, hold on, there's something I want to interject here. You can use hand gestures like that in order to signal the, your co-host of something, and you can read those unintentional nonverbal body cues when you're looking directly at your co-host. Stuff like you can see... When they're opening their mouth, they have something they want to add to this. So when you see them going, you don't immediately move on to your next subject because you know they want to say something here. And by the way, that works really well also if you can have your co-hosts on video so that you can see them. If your bandwidth and uh, processing power allows for that kind of thing. So some other things to consider uh, with your desk are think about your your posture with this desk. Uh, standing is a popular thing. There's a book I just recently read called Stand Up, and it's all about how we're basically killing ourselves by sitting down so often. And there, there's certainly much more health benefit to standing than there is to sitting. So if you can get one of those kinds of desks that can raise and lower so that you could stand while you work or while you answer emails, or you could sit if you need to, that could be fantastic. And also that can change the dynamic of your podcast. There is a different mood to sitting than there is from standing. Now, depending on your skills and your experience and such, there may not be all that much of a difference for you, or there could be. You may find that you have more energy when you're standing while you're doing your podcast than if you're sitting while recording your podcast. Or maybe it's the other way around. So that's something to think about for yourself. And sit, uh, the sit-stand or rising desks can be something that's manual where you crank a little thing and that shifts the gears and moves it up. Uh, it could be something that's completely motorized. So you press a button and it goes up to different levels or maybe it has presets and it's kind of fancy like that. It could be something that you get a regular desk and then you put a little desk on top of that desk this is starting to sound meta, I know. But you put this little platform on top of your desk, and then that platform can be raised or lowered. So the whole desk isn't going up and down. It's only that little platform, which could also be handy for maybe like arranging certain gear underneath that platform. You raise the desk and you stand up, and then it's very easy to reach that gear that's under the platform. But otherwise, uh, aside from that, you're working with it sitting down. Think about your distance from your monitor and such. I see certain desks that I'm surprised people enjoy working at them because the monitor is so far away. My monitor is just about an arm length away from my face. Uh, I don't like a monitor to be any farther than that because I want to be able to see the stuff on the screen. Some desks will put the screen really far back. Like instead of the the two feet or so that this is some monitors might sit three feet back and that that's just too far to me so i i'm sorry i can't recommend a specific desk for you but there are some things that you can consider how your gear will fit on it uh, where you'll put certain gear like for example if you have you know, i'll point my camera around again if you have a compressor limiter gate, which you don't have to have, but if you have one and it's an additional piece of hardware, that's what this thing is down here, a Behringer MDX 4600. This is something that you have to figure out where are you going to put that. Now note that I don't have my mixer sitting on top of this because the mixer and the uh, compressor limiter gate cause interference with each other. And I get a hiss when these things are directly on top of each other. So I had to separate them by some distance. And what I did with my desk is I found this little piece of wood that I drilled into the bottom of the desk. And then I drilled this um, compressor limiter gate onto it so that it's kind of like a rack mount system. And that works for me. That may not work for you. You may not even have that kind of gear, so maybe you don't need it. There are things that you could get that are like miniature sound racks where your mixer sits on the top and then there's space for stuff underneath. That could be really handy. Maybe all you need is a cart next to you that has your mixer. So you can very easily, without even looking, you reach down and you adjust the things on your cart and you're good to go. 
So it's really about what is your stuff that you need to work with? What are your goals for your podcast? How do you want your podcast to be recorded? And envision your kind of gear in these different scenarios. It could be as simple as a flat desk that's motorized and it's sit-stand desk. It could be an L-shaped desk like I use. It could be a desk with multiple tiers. Just think about your comfort with it. Think about your equipment that will fit into it. I mean, even with this desk, I have a non-standard setup here. You can see all kinds of behind the scenes. That This is what my setup actually looks like. I'm using my keyboard tray to hold my laptop computer. And then I use the keyboard on the laptop computer. This is my secondary screen down here. And then above that, I have my primary screen, which is currently a 24-inch screen. That's not standard. I know most people will have their second monitor next to their additional monitor. In my particular case, I like them being stacked vertically like that, which causes all kinds of problems in certain things where like Mac OS is not very well designed for vertically stacked stuff. Weird things happen uh, with that setup, but it's what I like in my particular case. Your case might be different. Maybe you like them side by side. So it's a lot of variables to consider, but some things that you might be able to use to be able to find the right podcast for you. All right, Maurice Fuller, who posted this question right before this live Q&A started, asked, what are your thoughts on making a slight change to the name of your podcast if you start to go in a new direction? What are your thoughts on translating the... Uh, let me answer these questions one at a time. So slight change to the name of your podcast. It depends. If the slight change is you are adding to the title tag, not actually changing the official name. For example, we have a podcast on our network. It's currently on hiatus, but it's called The Ramen Noodle. It's the first podcast I ever hosted. Start seven. With that podcast, from the title alone, you can't tell what it's about. So we changed the title as it appears in podcast apps. So it's now the Ramen Noodle hyphen family friendly clean comedy podcast. So we didn't change the name, but we added to it and clarified it. If you're doing that kind of thing, that's fantastic. I think you should do that kind of thing. It helps with your search engine optimization, helps your findability, and helps clarify those not very clear titles like the Ramen Noodle. What is that about? Or Welcome to Level 7. That's another one on our network that has an extended title. But if you're looking at changing the actual name, so the brand of your podcast, be careful with that. Uh, if, you, if you're going in such a significantly different direction than you started, you might instead want to start a new podcast altogether. Like with my podcast, the Audacity to Podcast, it's a podcast about podcasting. If I wanted to instead start talking about business, my personal life, uh, certain things from my own perspective, and I wanted to do the Daniel J. Lewis show, it would be stealing from my own audience and misleading my audience if I then rebranded the Audacity to Podcast to the Daniel J. Lewis show. Because people are coming and subscribed to that podcast because they wanted to hear podcast information. And then I start talking about other stuff that's not any longer focused on podcasting. So it's a bait and switch sort of thing. And by slowly pushing out those podcasting focused episodes with new personal focused episodes, the, show, uh, the show's search engine ranking would start to decrease. So if you're doing such a big change like that, I suggest launch something new. Uh, if it's, you said, slight change to the name of your podcast if you start to go in a new direction. And it really, really matters on, I mean, it, it does depend on how big of a direction that is. If it's a niching down for something. Uh, so for example, let's say, Um, well, here are a couple different examples of some things we could consider. Let's say you start a TV show podcast. So the whole point of your podcast is to discuss all the TV shows that you're watching. 
And that might be fine. So it's a general TV show podcast, whatever you've been watching that week or whatever multiple shows you're watching. But then at some point you decide that you would like to start a podcast dedicated to one of those TV shows. Instead of giving them five minutes per week, you want to give them a full hour and do an episode about each episode of the TV show. That would be a good case for spinning off a new podcast. And you tell your audience, hey, I've been doing this as short segments in this show, but I'm starting a whole new podcast that's focused on nothing but that one show. That's a great point for a spinoff. If instead, let's say you have a business podcast and you're talking about running your business. And at some point you decide you really want to focus in on talking about um, email marketing for business. Now that's a smaller niche of a niche you are already discussing. That's where you could do some slight branding, slight name change, because your content probably still appeals to the same audience. So I guess the difference between these is if your content is extremely mixed and you're deciding to cut everything else out and pick one of those topics that was otherwise mixed, that's a good case for a spinoff. If your content is very broad and you're niching down, I think that would be a good case for keeping the same podcast and doing a slight branding change. Whatever you do, let your audience know that it's coming and make sure that you are still fulfilling that promise for what did people come to your podcast for? What are they expecting from you? And does this new direction fit with what they're expecting and the promises that you set up with your podcast? If so, a rebrand is probably fine. If not, then maybe you should launch something different. Uh, if you go to the audacity to podcast.com slash rebrand, that's my episode where I get into more detail about should you rebrand a podcast or launch a new show. And that is episode number, in case you're interested in the number, that's episode 268. The audacity to podcast.com slash rebrand. And Maurice said, makes sense. Great insights. Thanks, Daniel. And they said, uh, exactly. Business podcast example. Now, Maurice also asked, what are your thoughts on translating the audio of your podcast to text to be indexed into a search engine? In other, in other words, uh, transcribed, uh, I think is what you probably meant. Autocorrect. We'll blame it on autocorrect. You meant to say transcribed. So turning your spoken word into text. If your podcast is a solo show, maybe. If your podcast has co-hosts or guests, probably not. Uh, my transcript, my opinion on transcriptions uh, is pretty strong and biased in certain ways, but I'll give you some reasons for this. Uh, in general, I think transcriptions are the lazy man's way to get show notes, to get bad show notes, because transcriptions usually don't read very well, especially if you have more than one person talking. If there is only one person talking and you're very good at communicating with your voice, maybe a transcript would be okay. But still, most of us don't speak in the same ways that we write or vice versa, and most of us, for the way that we speak, it would not be very readable. So you might spend as much time re-editing your transcription to make it readable as if you'd just written your thoughts as if it were a blog post instead of a podcast episode. Like that's the way I do it for the Audacity to Podcast. I write my show notes as if they're a blog post and sometimes I end up saying the exact same thing in the podcast very often because I do tend to write the same way I speak and speak the same way I write. So it's very often that I say almost the exact same thing. But there are many times where I go off on a tangent in the audio and I don't write that all down in the notes because it's not as important to be in the notes. So think about writing it as higher quality blog post kind of or article style notes and that will be better for search engines because what search engines are doing is becoming increasingly human and prioritizing high quality content because don't you as a human when you do a search on the internet you want high quality results right you don't want the low quality stuff you don't want something that just simply matches because of certain keywords you want something that's relevant 
trustworthy, and high quality. So transcriptions are not really that good at providing that means because transcriptions will end up having a lot of words and less actual content. So Google and other search engines will see that here's a post that's very long, but it's not very well written or it's not very good content and thus won't rank it as highly as if you'd rewritten the content maybe more concisely and more clearly, and that becomes high quality content. And Maurice's final question was, how did you set up Facebook to allow reminders for your live podcast? Well, first of all, a little technical thing. When I'm live streaming like this, this actually isn't technically a podcast. In fact, I don't even release, at least not yet, these Q&As as a podcast. A podcast is really a technical type of distribution for content. It's an RSS feed, downloadable media, syndicated through enclosures in an RSS feed, technical kind of stuff. Uh, so if you have a show that's only on YouTube or only on Facebook, it's not a podcast. Even if I was going to publish this episode as a podcast, here's a thing that may make your mind blow. I'm not actually podcasting right now because right now I'm live streaming. If I took this and made it downloadable as a podcast in an RSS feed later, then it would be a podcast, but it's not a podcast right now. So that little technical thing aside, how did I make Facebook allow you to get reminders for a live thing like this? Because when I do these live broadcasts on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern at the audacity to podcast.com slash live, I'm doing it live currently through Facebook live. So the way that I get this set up for these reminders, uh, you could do this from either a page a Facebook page, that is. So you have a page for your podcast. And I do recommend you have a Facebook page for your podcast, even if you don't use it all that much. There are plenty of good reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> ah, the joys of live. There are plenty of good reasons for you to have a Facebook page. And being able to live stream from that page is one of those great reasons. So people can see the audacity to podcast is going live. You could also stream from your personal profile and it's really up to you. I, I'm more of a fan of keeping things, keeping your branding siloed, uh, which is a way of saying basically all of your stuff stays in its own kind of silo. Everything for the audacity to podcast is under the audacity to podcast brand. So I don't use my personal profile on Facebook for live streaming the Audacity to Podcast or my other podcasts. I use the pages, not profiles, but pages for those separate podcasts, those identities for them. Uh, just like for Once Upon a Time, we have a separate Twitter account for our Once Upon a Time podcast about a TV show. And so our Once Upon a Time themed content goes into that Twitter account instead of my own Twitter account. So decide whether you're going to use a page or a post. And then what you do is you can use many different tools to actually conduct the live stream. But the main thing is on the Facebook side is instead of simply going live, you schedule the event to go live. You enter a time, a date, and I think Facebook at this moment can only schedule out up to seven days in advance for a live event. And so when you create that, anyone who is uh, a fr one of your friends, in the case of using your personal profile, or who is following your page, in the case of you're using a Facebook page for your live streaming, they have the potential to see a notification about when you're going live, depending on how they have their notifications configured for your page, as well as for your live events. Like when I finish this live event here on Facebook, if you're watching this on Facebook, when I finish the live event uh, I believe you'll still be um, presented with a button that will say something like uh, enable notifications or notify me when this page goes live or it's something like that. But some button you press that when you press it, it adds the audacity to podcast to your notifications so that it will let you know when I'm going live. Similarly on YouTube, how you can subscribe to something and you can adjust those notifications for a YouTube channel. You can say that you're subscribed, but you don't want to be notified of new episodes, or you can subscribe and then be notified of new episodes. It depends on 
your own personal preferences for subscribing to those things. So on the Facebook side, that's all I did. Scheduled it in advance instead of just boom, went live. And uh, I don't know about some of the, the mobile app experiences, if you can schedule a live event there. I do this through a desktop and using professional broadcasting software, OBS, which is actually free. Uh, so that way I can use my webcam, which gives me better color than my um, mobile phone camera does because of my very black background. It does crazy, scary looking things to my face uh, because of how much black there is in the background. Uh, I think my camera is racist, maybe. But what I can do on the desktop side very easily is schedule an event. On the mobile side, you may be able to do that as well. But when you schedule it, then it can send a notification out so people see, oh, you're going to go live at a certain time. And they might then also see the notification when you actually go live. But they have to first be connected. So they have to like your page. They have to be friends with you on Facebook, whichever kind of approach you're taking. And they have to have their notifications enabled for you. All right, back to the uh, questions I received earlier. So thank you, Maurice, for those questions. Well, let me jump over now to what I mentioned earlier, SoundCloud. Should you leave SoundCloud? And maybe you're thinking, oh, no, not this again. Someone else talking about podcasts and SoundCloud. In short, yes, I think you should leave SoundCloud. Now, SoundCloud... Uh, had to recently lay off 40% of its staff, which is not a good thing for its company. Now, there are cases, though, of companies slimming down, canceling products, focusing on what they do best, reducing their staff, and finding great success. I have worked for a company that did that once. They way overhired when they wanted to launch something. And when they launched that thing, they realized, wow, we got way too many employees and I don't know how what the percentage was that they had to lay off, but I know it was a dark day uh, when the board met and a whole bunch of people got laid off. A uh, really dark day for the organization. Uh, and that was because they way overhired. To this day, the organization is thriving, and I think they've now hired many times as many people as they hired back then. So just because they're laying off people doesn't mean they're going out of business. But it could mean that they're going to reduce their offering. Again, that's not a bad thing for a company. There have been many companies that have decided we're no longer going to make this kind of product. Uh, let's think of one of those companies. Um, Apple. Apple used to make all kinds of products. Did you know Apple made a gaming console? Apple used to make printers. Apple made tablets. Oh, wait, they still do that. <laughs> but Apple made the Newton, which was a tablet long before tablets were really respected. There were all kinds of products Apple made many years ago. And when some political things happened and Steve Jobs was let go of his own company, then Apple started making all of these different products. When he came back, he canceled a bunch of these products. And he wanted to focus on doing fewer things really well. And that's what we have today. The things that Apple does for the most part. I know they've had some flops here and there and they will again in the future probably. But the things that they do, they tend to do really well because they focus on those things. Lots of companies focus down on what they do really well and can end up being profitable, successful with that idea. So, with SoundCloud, though, year over year, they've been losing more and more money. Yes, their income has gone up, but their expenses, I believe their expensive ha expenses have risen even faster than their income has. Now, maybe by firing 40% of their staff, they'll be able to finally get closer to staying within budget. But they are running out of money. And for a business to be constantly losing money is not a good thing. However, Amazon, when they were a company in the early days, when they first started, they were losing money year after year. But now look at Amazon today. Most of us will shop on Amazon before we shop anywhere else for things. And they are now profitable and highly successful today. So I'm not saying don't leave SoundCloud. 
I am saying leave SoundCloud. I don't know whether SoundCloud will be gone. What I'm more, I, I do feel like they will probably be gone within the next couple of years, if not later this year. Uh, SoundCloud had a blog post on their own site to say, we're not going anywhere or something like SoundCloud is here to stay. Okay, that's fine. But I don't think podcasters should be there to stay. Because you know, everything I said about focusing down, cutting things out, cutting out the fat, focusing on what they do best for SoundCloud, that is not and never has been podcasting. The podcasting aspect of SoundCloud is almost like an afterthought. And you look at the way SoundCloud treats it, and it, it really gets that feeling of this is an afterthought. It doesn't have all the great podcasting features that nearly everyone else has. And I really doubt that podcasting feature will be improved for a while. It's most likely it's not going to support the new iTunes tags that are already available and will be uh, more uh, prominent with the release of iOS 11 this fall. SoundCloud probably won't even think about those things. What is working for SoundCloud? And when you hear people saying, oh, SoundCloud is great for such and such, most of the time it's for music, especially for independent artists. And the bandwidth usage for that kind of thing is much smaller than for podcasters. I mean, think of it this way. A podcast episode, an hour-long podcast episode, let's say you encode it at my recommended encoding settings, an hour-long podcast episode ends up being 30 megabytes, a 30 megabyte file, which is kind of big on the internet. Even though it will download quickly, it's still, let's call that a big file. So you get a thousand people subscribed to your podcast and every time you release an episode, a thousand people are downloading a 30 megabyte file. So that is 30,000 megabytes necessary, uh, roughly 30,000 megabytes necessary of bandwidth to send out every week when 1,000 people are downloading your 30 megabyte file uh, for a weekly podcast. Think about a daily podcast. That would be much higher than that um, for how much bandwidth they'd have to provide. Think then about a song. Well, first of all, musicians, most musicians, even independent artists, are not releasing an ep a song every single week. They'll release one, and it gets out there, it gets popular and such. Maybe they'll release five in a month and then have nothing else for several months. So that requires a lot less bandwidth. Also, uh, music, even though it's a higher quality audio file, it's much shorter you don't have hour-long songs, typically. You don't have a five-minute long song. So instead of a 30-megabyte file, you'll have maybe a five-megabyte file. And so when a 1,000 people want to download a five-megabyte file, that's much less of a bandwidth demand. Plus, they're not having to do that every single week, probably. So SoundCloud's main area their main focus really is music. So as they've now laid off 40% of their staff, I have no idea what those staff did for SoundCloud before. But as they've consolidated their staff, they're going to consolidate their tools and their interests as well. And even with, like, with people like Chance the Rapper talking about SoundCloud, it's still focused on music. So I really think... That even if SoundCloud doesn't go away, the podcast feature in SoundCloud will either go away or continue to be ignored. And you don't want that. You want to be on a platform that supports you as a podcaster, provides the latest podcasting resources and tools and supports these new tags and such. So please get off SoundCloud. And you might say that... Uh, I'm Well, okay, I am biased because I've experienced SoundCloud. I've tried SoundCloud. I see many blaring, glaring problems with SoundCloud. Now, I, there are several other hosting platforms that I'd recommend above SoundCloud. Now, don't think that you can go to these other hosting platforms and get their superior service for the price of SoundCloud. See, SoundCloud is failing for a reason. They're, they're promising too much and charging too little. 
And that's not a good recipe for a successful business. So if you go somewhere else, yes, you might have to pay more. But you pay more because you know that company is not going to go out of business and that other company takes better care of you. So look at Libsyn, look at Blueberry, look at Spreaker, look at Podbean. Uh, Short reason for each of them. If you're WordPress focused, go with Blueberry. If you want just a system where you can publish everything to it and very easily have your own mobile app, go with Libsyn. If you like the idea of live streaming with your podcast or you have multiple shows, go with Spreaker. If you want to integrate crowdfunding and patron-only episodes in your podcast feed, go with Podbean. Now, my promo code Noodle will give you a free month with each of those companies. And here's something I learned only today. Uh, Most of these companies will migrate your podcast over for free. Libsyn, however, does have a $25 flat rate migration fee for up to 10 gigabytes of data to migrate. But I just discovered this today. Libsyn will migrate SoundCloud users for free. That's pretty cool. Blueberry will migrate anyone for free. Spreaker is pretty easy. Podbean is pretty easy, too. Um, So the promo code Noodle gives you at least a month free with any of those companies, Blueberry, Libsyn, Spreaker, or um, Podbean, if you're interested in them. Really, please get off SoundCloud. Some podcasters that I listen to who often said, find us on SoundCloud. I noticed in their most recent episode, they stopped saying, find us on SoundCloud. They moved to some other platform. I forget what it was. But um, definitely, please get off SoundCloud. Go somewhere else, I, somewhere else reputable. Yes, you may have to invest a little bit more money into it, but I think it's worth it so you that you don't have to keep bouncing from company to company as different companies die. Like look at Podango. Well, you can't. They're gone. Uh, look at mypodcast.com or was it mypodcast.com? They're gone. Podshow, they're gone. Mevio related with Podshow, they're gone. Uh, Signal Leaf was really active in the podcasting space a couple years ago. They're gone too. So a bunch of companies like that gone. You want to go with a company that will stick around and has stuck stuck around and shown that they care about podcasters. Uh, As Mike Wilkerson said in the chat, self-reputation destruction has also plagued them. Doing bad things that show publicity kills quick. Yeah, and they have done bad things. Um, Back to the live streaming thing uh scott smith mentioned this in the chat and i wanted to bring this up blive.tv is a cool service that you can use for live streaming to facebook Uh, they will have paid plans soon so keep that in mind don't build your whole hopes on that platform but it is a cool system to use that gives you various abilities then Back to my list, Chloe said, I'm researching the possibility of starting a podcast, but I am pretty sure that most of the podcast would be on information found from other sources, though it would be my narrative. What is the responsibility of the podcaster to recognize their source, website, book, and other sources? Have you had any issues with this or any way to solve this question? Thank you, Chloe, for that question. This goes to integrity, really. It it doesn't matter whether you're a podcaster, you're a book author, you're a blogger, you're a journalist, cite your sources. So the way that you can do that on a podcast, I I like the example of uh, the story behind podcast, Emily Prokop's podcast, which you can get at the story behind, uh, let me check this. URL against the story behind podcast.com. Yes, the story behind podcast.com. So in Emily's podcast, it's it's the story behind different things. So you get to hear the story behind beards, the story behind mustaches, the story behind America's bald eagle, which I thought that was a really cool one. I'm very patriotic at heart. So I enjoyed hearing that episode. I listened to Emily's podcast. So what she does at the end of her episode is she says, Information for this episode uh, was cited from this site and this site and this site and Mental Floss and this site and this site and this site. So she cites very quickly her, her main sources, but then also points you to her website for the complete list of sources. So that's something you could do with your podcast too, depending on your setup, depending on your flow. Maybe near the end, you say information for this episode was sourced by or sourced from such and such. 
Uh, now, if it's something that you are quoting in some way uh, in the flow of your podcast, so it's not like you did research on things and wrote your own narrative like Emily does. Maybe that's what you're planning to do, Chloe. But if um, it's where you want to quote from something in your narrative, then I suggest that's where you cite that resource. So if, if I'm going to quote from um, a book, 48 Days to the Work You Love by Dan Miller, for example, and I say something uh, about that or I want to read a specific quote from that, that's where I would say, here's a quote from Dan Miller's 48 Days to the Work You Love, and then read the quote or something like that. So there it's in the context of that quote or quotation. So you don't have to give the full like standard bibliographical, bi bibli I, I can't say it right now, but you don't have to give that whole thing where you say page number and here's the publisher, here's the year and all of that. You could put that in your show notes to be extra thorough. And, and that's the other thing that you could do is you could put your links and your citations in your show notes and in your podcast, you say, check the show notes for all of my citations or my sources for this. Now, one other thing to consider, uh, because you did mention about, you weren't sure about trademark or copyright kind of thing, is how much of the copyrighted work are you using? Because everything, when it's released, is copyrighted automatically and is protectable uh, and defendable by law. So everything is instantly copyrighted. You can't assume that because it doesn't have a copyright date that it means you can use it freely. There are certain exceptions or defenses, uh, certain allowances that, uh, like free use, where you can use copyrighted material in certain ways without having to get permission first, such as for educational use, for, um, for parody or satire, certain things like that. Like if I wanted to do a parody of the, fr the, the song, Let It Go, from Frozen, I could most likely do that under fair use and not have to worry about it. But if I wanted to play the Frozen soundtrack in my podcast as my theme song, that wouldn't be allowable. So think about the majority, the, the portion that you want to use of that copyrighted work. If it's a whole chapter, that's too much. If it's a paragraph or a sentence, that's fine. And think about how much of your content or how much of, sorry, let me say that differently. Think about how much of their content is, uh, the, I'm still not saying this correctly. What percentage of your content, here we go. What percentage of your content is actually theirs? So for example, if I wanted to do the, um, the quote of the day podcast or the chapter of the day podcast where the whole purpose of my podcast is I read a chapter of this book. Well, for one thing, that's too much of the book to give away uh, in the podcast. But for another thing, that would mean then my, the majority of my content is actually someone else's content. That would be a copyright violation. There is no like 30 second principle or a certain limit on words and stuff. It's really, it all depends and it's relative. But if you're citing something as a resource, if you're quoting from something, try and keep it short and cite it or quote it in some way where people can know what it, the source was. Definitely put the link's full information in your notes and try to give as much credit as you can for those certain things. Now, if it's something super simple like I read in one of Dan Miller's books the other day how you should do such and such. That's not a full quotation, so there's not really a need to cite that. So it really depends on how you're recording your own podcast. But thank you, uh, Chloe, for that question. Now, Emily Prokop, host of the Story Behind podcast, is in the chat room right now, and she said, having the backlinks in my show notes actually got an episode shared by the website. Another great reason to list and link to your sources. Yes, that is a great reason. I see when people link to the Audacity to podcast, uh, I usually see, well, when they link to a specific episode, I usually get those pingbacks um, depending on how they have their site configured. So it's cool. I can pop over to their site and see, oh yeah, they, they listed me here and I'll, I'll listen to this or I'll check this out or I'll share this as well. So there is that great benefit to linking to them. And the last question from my list here, unless someone in the chat room comes up with another question before I go, uh, which I do need to go in a few minutes here. 
W. Scott Smith asked on Twitter, he asked me, besides just asking, how can you get listeners to engage with the show more? Like emails, tweets, submitting stories, etc. It's kind of ironic that this question is in response to my Twitter post. And the question is about getting people to respond to questions. But what would you expect from a podcast about podcasting? So... The, there are two big principles to think about here, and a lot of things fall under these two principles in how to get your audience to engage more and participate more, share and respond to things more. These two big things are first, there has to be a benefit to them to participate. And second, it has to be easy and clear. So let's dig into this a little bit more. A benefit to them. If you say, hey, share this episode out, there's not much benefit to them. Or if you say, hey, respond to this to let us know how much you liked our episode, not so much a benefit to them. Sometimes even your questions, there's not as much benefit to them to answer those questions. Like if you say, um, tell me what microphone do you use for your podcast? Tweet me at the Daniel J. Lewis. And some people will respond because they'll be eager to say what microphone they, they have, but there's not as much benefit to them in that. So what is in it for your audience to engage? Don't make it only about you receiving value from your audience. Make it some kind of shared value that by their engaging, they're receiving value too. For example... If uh, you answer questions in your podcast, well, that's a big thing there is you tell your audience, what's something you would like to know about this? Send me your question and I'll answer it in the next uh, episode or I'll answer it in a future episode. So there, they're already getting the immediate benefit to see that there's a possibility you will give content directly to them or uh, designed for them. The other cool thing you can do is add on to that even a little bit more benefit to say something like, and I'll give you a shout out on the podcast or I'll link to your website or your Twitter account or, or whatever like that, or I'll retweet you uh, if you respond with this kind of thing. So that's something there. Like if you use Instagram or Twitter, uh, then you could say, send me your photos of your studio and I'll retweet my favorites or something like that or whatever it is that you're asking them to do. Then they think, oh, this would be really cool to get someone famous to share my stuff out. That's their value that they see in it for them. So what is in it for them? With the Audacity to Podcast, um, I've, I've been able to get podcast reviews fairly easily for a while with the Audacity. Well, I didn't really ask all that much. But I took a new approach to getting more podcast reviews, and podcast reviews do not affect your ranking in iTunes. Uh, so get that out of your mind. That's a myth. But there are other benefits to podcast reviews, and one of those is simply engaging with your audience, getting to know your audience a little bit more. So for the Audacity to Podcast, what I've started doing lately is I give shout outs to the podcaster's podcast when they write a review for the Audacity to Podcast, my show. So I tell them, in your review, please put in your name and the name of your podcast, and I'll give it a shout out in my show. And I do that. So in my episodes, you hear me near the end of the episode, I read my a couple iTunes reviews or podcast reviews, not necessarily from iTunes, but wherever they come in. And if the person mentions their podcast or I can figure it out from their comment, then I read something about that podcast and I link to it. So when I started doing that, I started getting two to three reviews per week. And it comes in waves. Uh, like even just this last week, I got four new podcast reviews for the show. Uh, and that was specifically in iTunes from that kind of thing. So they see there's value in it for them. That's why. They're writing the reviews because podcasters are thinking, oh, I'd love to have him link to my podcast and mention his podcast uh, in his own podcast. And there, there is, of course, I reserve the right to not do that to certain podcasts where it may be something I just I, I can't for conscious reasons uh, link to for some 
particular reason, but that hasn't been an issue yet. But I mean, like if it was like the, the killing innocent children podcast, I'm not going to give that a link. I'm not going to give that a shout out in my podcast. And I think my audience would respect me for that and not respect you for having a podcast like that. But anyway, so what's the value in it for them? That's the first big thing. Second big thing is make it easy. Not only in process, but in your actual call to action. So for example, in what I mean by actual call to action here, if I say, um, ask me a question about podcasting and I'll answer it in a future Q&A, I could then say, send that question to me, feedback at the Audacity to Podcast, or tweet it to me here, or send it to me on Instagram, or post it on the website, or comment on the show notes, or go here, or do this, or do that. I could start to overwhelm you by giving you all of these different ways you could engage with that single call to action. And that's overwhelming. And makes it much more complicated. Instead, keep it simple. Point them to one or two ways to do it. Or maybe you point them to a contact page that lists your multiple ways to do it. So you could say, hey, send me your question. Email feedback at the audacity to podcast.com. Or you say, call in your question to this phone number, or we have other contact methods on the website. Keep it simple. Keep the, the call to action simple so you're not overwhelming them with all of these things they have to do or they have to make a decision which way to send it in or maybe they send it in in all of those ways and then you get overwhelmed. Also make the actual process of it easier. If you're giving them an email address, make it an easy to remember, easy to spell email address. Um, like if your, your domain or your website has uh, numbers in it, you might have to register and make sure there's an email address for both the spelled way as well as the numeral way. You know, if your podcast is uh, 10 ways to die, then you need T-E-N as well as one zero. So make the process easy as well as like on your website, if you post an email address on there, don't make them have to replace your brackets with actual symbols and piece things together. When an email address is like that, it's basically saying, no, don't contact me. I really don't want to hear from you. But if your email address is clickable, it's in there, you can do certain ways to uh, encrypt your email address like plugins and such like Cryptex and just search the WordPress plugin database um, for some different ways. Or maybe it's Twitter. Make sure that the audience you're reaching out to is probably on Twitter. And uh, make sure that your Twitter handle is easy to remember, easy to enter. So make the process easy for them. Make your call to action easy. Make the process easy. And make sure there's some kind of benefit in it for them as well. Why should they want to do it, not just because you're so awesome. And yes, you may be totally awesome. You are awesome, really. But that shouldn't be the main reason. So make it easy for them. And of course, you probably know this already, but they need to have a reason to do it. Not only for their own benefit, but what what's actually the purpose of this. And you need to have a reason too. Not simply, hey, email us if you liked this show. What, what benefit does that serve anyone if they email and tell you, hey, I like this episode? Okay, it's nice to know, but it does it change the show? Does it make new content? Does it inspire something? Does it get them involved in some way? Not all that much, maybe. So make there be a benefit to your audience and make it easy. Okay, going back to the chat room, I've seen a bunch of comments while I was going along, and I saw a question on here. Mike Wilkerson said, comprehensive show notes that include even just the things you, you're referencing are the way to go. You're creating a living online resource library for whatever it is you're talking about. And that is a great example, that when you're talking about many different things, make sure anything that you mention, that there's a link to it in your show notes. So not only is it easy for your audience, but then for you too, you can go back and reference, when was the last time I talked about such and such? You can find that very easily in um, 
your show notes. Mike, oh, here's the question. Mike asked, you showed a silver device called a gate. What does that do? And why am I not using the one I have? <laughs> I, uh, this will be the last question I'll answer and then I need to go. But you can send your questions to feedback at theaudacitypodcast.com. Preferably one question per email. Keep your questions short as much as possible. And I can try to answer those in a future Q&A live on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern at theaudacitypodcast.com. So the thing I showed is a compressor limiter gate. So it does three functions. It compresses, it limits, it gates. And these are all audio things that it does. And it's doing it live as I'm speaking, I, you could do any of these things in post-production. The first thing you need to know, uh, so it's doing kind of processing and adjusting things about my audio, and I'll explain what those are in a moment. But the first thing you need to know is that these are destructive edits. So if I get my gate wrong or compressor or limiter, if I get it wrong, it's permanently baked into my audio that way. Uh, and there are certain cases where you may not want to use it at all. So let's start by discussing a compressor. What a compressor does is it compresses, it reduces the dynamic range of audio within a certain, uh, above a certain threshold. So as we speak, we vary in volume level. Most of us do. I just now did it. Very commonly, we start a sentence and start a word more loudly than we finish a sentence or finish a word. You can often see it in your waveform where maybe you see the starts of your sentence are loud and then it gets quieter and then new sentence, loud, quiet, loud, quiet. That's the way we talk. Uh, many people do. So there's some dynamic range there, loud spots and quiet spots. There are also some people may talk quieter or more loud or louder than others. So dynamic range, some difference in volume levels. So what a compressor does is it will have a threshold. Say any audio that's above this level should be compressed down by a particular ratio so that instead of a signal now being 10 decibels above that threshold, it's five. That would be a two to one ratio. So apply that ratio to anything above that threshold. Then something that was two decibels above that threshold would now be one. Something that was four decibels would now be two. Something that was eight would now be four. Something that was 10 would now be five. So you see what it's doing. It's compressing everything above that threshold in half. It's not compressing everything because stuff below that threshold is ignored, but it compresses everything above that. So it is reducing the volume level but it's also reducing the volume difference because by going from uh, 10 to 5, it's reducing how much range there is. So think of those numbers, 2, 4, and 10. The jump between 4 and 10 is pretty big. But if we compress all of that down to now 1, 2, and 5, the jump between 2 and 5 is now smaller. There is still a little bit of a jump but it's not as big of a jump. So it's not like setting everything to be the exact same volume level. You would not want that. It would sound very weird. Some people do that. Some radio people do that, and it doesn't sound that good. So that's what compressor does. It reduces those volume in those areas. And most of the time, especially with software compressors, they'll add makeup gain, which means they'll raise the volume back up later. So a compressor is basically smoothing out those spots so it's reducing the loud points and then adds makeup gain so it's kind of like it's reducing the loud and raising the lower uh, that's the basic end result so it smooths out the volume differences a limiter is kind of a safety net it for some of us we might get loud when we're excited when we laugh certain things can happen where we get really loud and if you get too loud then what happens is the audio signal gets clipped. That's why we call it clipping. And when it clips, it can't capture a certain amount of the audio signal. And thus, the result is corruption in the audio. Some crackling noise, maybe some, some bad sounding audio, something that's indistinguishable is very painful to listen to. Even at reduced volume levels, it can be painful to listen to. That's what happens when audio gets too loud, louder than it can, and it gets clipped. So what a limiter does 
is it sets this top level threshold to say it's kind of like a compressor but it's an extremely aggressive compressor where it says anything that gets above this line needs to be reduced so it's no longer above that line so whereas with compression you might compress an entire track and it affects everything in the track a limiter might affect only those few points that go above that line and it makes sure that absolutely nothing goes above that line so you never want to apply a limiter really low like uh, if your average volume level while you're speaking is between negative 12 and negative 6 you would not want to set a limiter at negative 15 because then that would say everything above negative 15 gets reduced to negative 15. That would sound horrible in your audio. So a limiter is more of a safety net to prevent the corruption in your audio uh, from laughs. Uh, so some people, when they laugh, they laugh really loudly compared to everything else. Other people laugh the same volume of what they're saying. So it's more of a safety net, the limiter is, to prevent corruption. And um, that goes in before the recording. So it very quickly drops the level and very quickly raises it back up to prevent any kind of corruption or distortion. Uh, then the final thing is the gate. Think of an actual physical gate on a fence. It's open or it's closed. A gate in audio uh, works that same way or it's either open or it's closed. It's not partially open or partially closed, so there's no glass half full kind of thing. It's either fully open or fully closed. And what the gate will then do is you set a threshold. As you notice, compressors, limiters, gates all work from some kind of threshold. Each one would have a different threshold. The threshold for the gate is to say, whenever the audio gets above this level, this threshold, open the gate and let everything through. But when the audio falls below that threshold, close the gate and let nothing through. So in my particular case, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn my camera around if well, it doesn't reach all the way down there. And it won't, actually, the stand it's on won't keep it there very easily. So here's what I want you to do. Watch this part that I'm pointing to. And you may not be able to see the color difference as well because of the exposure right now. But that's closed when it's on the left. But when it's on the right... That is open. When it's green, it's open. When it's red, it's closed. So you see it blinking back and forth as I'm talking. So if I just hum, mm, you see it stay open because the audio signal that it's getting is above that threshold. And then when I stop talking, it closes completely and it lets no sound through. So practically speaking, here's a way to illustrate this is a background noise. It's getting warm in my office here. I always turn off my air conditioner while I'm recording and my computer fan because I'm live streaming is generating noise. So what the compressor is or what the gate is doing is not filtering noise. It does not clean your audio. That would be that requires processing. It's closing and letting nothing through or it's opening and letting everything through. So what's happening is as I have the background noise of my fan, or if I turned on my air conditioner and had that background noise, you would hear that background noise behind me whenever I'm speaking. But when I stop speaking, you would not hear that background noise. So, and you may not be able to hear this because of the way the internet bandwidth is working, or maybe your headphones, speakers, anything like that. But what I'm going to do now is turn off my compressor limiter gate. So a bunch of things just turned off, but one of those being the gate is now turned off. And now when I'm quiet, you probably hear the computer fan in the background. It's still fairly quiet, but it is there. I'll uh, emphasize this a little more by moving my microphone down. So now as I awkwardly talk into my microphone down next to my computer, you hear the background noise constantly, even when I'm quiet. But when I engage the gate, you hear nothing when I'm not talking, but you can hear the background noise while I'm talking. So the purpose of the gate is not to filter background noise. It, it closes when the main noise stops.
basically. So what that's useful for is a couple things. It can be useful for background noise in that in some cases, it means the background noise will be less noticeable. Or let me put it this way, um, here's, because here's a better way to look at it. Don't think of a constant background noise like a hiss. Think of a quiet background noise, like maybe a dog barking in the background. So if I stopped talking and a dog barked in the background very quietly, the microphone might not pick up, or I'm sorry, the microphone might pick up that microphone, but because that, that dog bark, that is, the dog doesn't have a microphone. The microphone might pick it up, but because that dog bark is below this threshold, the gate doesn't open up. So the dog bark is down here, my voice is up here, but the dog bark wasn't loud enough to make the gate open. Now, if the dog came into the room and barked, it would be up here, and thus the gate would open completely. Where this can become a problem, remember that a hardware compressor limiter gate is baking this permanently into your audio. This can become a problem if you use a gate and you have a noisy environment. Like if I had my air conditioner running, my fan was even louder on the computer than it is now, so I have all of this background noise going on, and the gate is coming in and out, that can be even more distracting. That's one problem. So you're hearing this every time I'm talking. So whenever I speak, you hear the noise very loudly. And when I don't, you don't hear any noise. That can be more distracting than if you heard that noise constantly in the background. Plus, um, software can be more intelligent than hardware for this kind of thing. What software can do, like Audacity can do this, Audition and anything else that has noise reduction, you give it a footprint uh, or a signature of what the sound is. So you record that noise, just the straight <laughs> You select that portion, you say, this is an example of the noise. And then it can process the whole audio to look for anything that matches that pattern and try and reduce it. It does pick up some other stuff along the way, unfortunately. So that's why you don't want to do too much noise reduction uh, or noise, complete noise removal. But um, so it, it can clean based on that signature. What is the noise signature or noise profile? If you've used a gate that opens and closes, you would have no noise profile to work with. Because any time that you would be quiet and the microphone would otherwise record only noise, the gate is closed, so it's recording nothing. Therefore, no noise profile. So you can't do effective noise removal. So all that to say, do you need a compressor limiter gate? No. No, you don't. Of all of the equipment I have in my studio, let me think about this, because I've, I've purchased some things that I haven't used before. Yes, of everything I have in my studio, the most useless piece of equipment is that compressor limiter gate. Now, the one place it is the most useful for me is when I have a co-host who's sitting in the same room with me. And if we're being recorded into the same audio track, because what can happen is his microphone can pick up my voice or my microphone could pick up his voice. Uh, even though I have acoustically treated room here, it can still pick up some crossover. But if that, that other voice, the unintentional voice is below the gate, then my microphone doesn't pick him up. So my co-host microphone, which is on the other side of the desk from me, uh, the noise it would pick up of my voice would be almost purely from reverb. So if that microphone's gate closes while my microphone's gate is open, then the only version of my voice being picked up is what my microphone is picking up, not what his microphone is picking up. So I get a cleaner audio signal like that. Or it works the other way around too. When he speaks and my microphone is quiet or the gate is closed, then it's the other way around. His voice is being picked up from only his microphone, not from my microphone too. So that's the useful case for a gate. Um, but most of the other stuff... In fact, I may change gear uh, someday in the future, especially depending on how the mix pre development continues on. 
I've got a review video of that that I'll be recording later this week, but um, it's a separate device. I don't have time to talk about that now, but um, I may actually switch so that I'd no longer be using a Zoom H4n, a Behringer MDX4600, and a Behringer X1832 USB mixer, and a Behringer U-Control audio interface. I may not be using all four of those things and all of the cables connecting these things anymore, depending on how stuff goes with the MDX or with the, uh, the Mix Pre. And so I might be doing more processing in software instead of in the hardware. All right, that's it for now. I went a little bit beyond time, uh, but Mike said that's a tremendous explanation. Many thanks. You're very welcome. Uh, <laughs> Patrick said, I always get so sad when I see Daniel J. Lewis is missing Mike flag. Yes, I really do. Seriously, I need to get a Mike flag for this thing. Uh, it's been missing for almost forever. Uh, I need to get some branding on there, especially now that I have a logo I'm more proud of. And uh, there's some other comments that have come in. All right. So if you want your podcasting questions answered like this when I do this live on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, then email your questions, feedback at theaudacitypodcast.com. I can't promise that I can answer via email uh, but I might be able to set it aside as a question that I can answer in one of these future Q&As. So that's feedback at theaudacitytopodcast.com. And please join me for these Q&As at theaudacitytopodcast.com slash live on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, usually most of the time. And you'll see me tweet out and such if I'm live or if I'm not live. Watch for the next episode of The Audacity to Podcast, which will be about uh, the five kinds of people you should have in your circle. Uh, it's something I think that will be encouraging and motivational for you to recognize the value of different people, including your competition. Yes, I think they should be in your circle too. So watch for that. That publishes on Tuesday, July 18th, 2017 over at theaudacitypodcast.com. Thank you very much for joining me. Keep growing your podcast. Keep making it even better and better and subscribe to The Audacity to Podcast over at theaudacitypodcast.com. Dot com. And I'm Daniel J. Lewis from theaudacitypodcast.com. Thanks for watching.